how to fight a bear and instructor development course after action it is a uh, keyword how to fight a bear we're going to talk about uh, that today duracoat finished firearm as uh, of course, as always, um, we're going to have a Brownhouse bullet point. Talk about red dots. You guys sick about talking about red dots again? I thought that everything had been said about red dots on handguns. I was incorrect. Uh, there's actually more to be to be said. The uh, Student of the Gun Homeroom brought to you by Crossbreed Holsters. We're going to talk about how to defend yourself against a bear. Uh, and you're like, why would I want to do that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. First ever student of the gun instructor development course. And, uh, hey, do you guys, I, my question to you guys is, did you see the report about U.S., I'm going to type it up, U.S. diesel supply shortage? I believe everyone's seen that, but go ahead and tell, tell them what you're talking well, about. Well, so my question to all of you freaks in the audience is, this, there's a story from Bloomberg.com, yeah, but it's everywhere. Diesel supply of just 25 days. How do you get to that point as a nation? That's what we... Oh, oh wow. <laughs> the author is a, is a Chinese person. Uh, the author of this story is... A, how... Where, that, where are we at is that in like the notes here? We're, oh, I, just, I just typed this up. Oh, okay. We're not in the notes. How interesting is it? Is it that irony that the, uh, that the Chinese meat puppet would be reported on by a Chinese reporter? But my question to you guys out in my audience is this. How, are we going to ever be honest and ask ourselves, how do we get to this point? And then when we answer that, and we all know the reason. I mean, all intellectually honest people know how we got to this point because there are criminals at the helm. There, there's a, a uh, meat puppet at the helm. And the meat puppet is surrounded by handlers. And their handlers, the handlers up there in, uh, in Washington, D.C. that are giving the meat puppet his talking points that are writing the meat puppet puppet speeches for him, uh, finding him when he gets lost. Did you see that, Jared? There's another one where he's like walking and he turns to the right and he starts walking off the wrong direction. They got to go grab him and turn him around and send him the right direction. Again, I don't know how many that's been now. Um, see, they don't care about national sovereignty. They don't care about national strength. They don't care about secure borders. They don't even. They don't care about your economy, how much you're paying for fu for fuel and electricity and food. They could give two shites about that. They don't care. They care about pushing their psychotic, woke, liberal agenda. That's what they care about. They care about poisoning your children's minds. They care about murdering babies. That's what they care about. And if you people uh, end up starving or paying insane amounts of money for your food and every, you're like, well, I don't care about diesel. I have an electric car. I'm waiting for that to pop up. Well, all you people that are worried about diesel prices, you should have gotten smart and bought a, an electric car. I mean, didn't that already come up? Didn't Colbert do like, a, I'll pay $1,000 a gallon for, for gas because I drive electric. Yeah. Ha, 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 how does your How does the food that you eat get to the store that you buy it from? That your, that your servants, when you send your servants to the store to buy food for you, uh, how does that food get to that store? Does it arrive in a Tesla? Whoa, whoa. Uh, no. So everything that you buy from every store that you go to arrived at that store in a truck fueled by diesel fuel. All of the food that you eat, if it was made in the United States, well, even if it wasn't, uh, was cultivated by farmers who used tractors that used diesel fuel 
so I don't I don't get my food from farms I get it from the store yeah. I, I don't I don't have to hunt for my meat I buy it from the store where no animals were harmed yeah where no animals were ever harmed yeah uh, that's one of the great tweets from like 2015 you don't have yeah. to hunt for your meat yeah I don't hunt for my food I get it from the store because no animals were harmed I hunt for my meat with a magnifying glass sometimes. Yeah. So my question to you is this. Not only, all right, first of all, why is that a thing? And how does the current administration, how do the, how do the criminals in D.C. deflect responsibility for that? You're telling me that the Secretary of Energy never came to a meeting and raised their hand and said, hey, P.S., we're running out of fuel. We should probably do something like this before it becomes a crisis. Oh, I don't know. Are you prepared? Is your family prepared to deal with a food shortage crisis? Or, well, it won't be a shortage. No, everything, it'll just be $5 for a carton of eggs and $10 for a gallon of milk. And it will be. What the $5 hell are you talking about? for a loaf of bread. Are you prepared to deal with that? Yeah, it'll be there. The prices, you'll just have to pay more for it. So everyone's going to go to their, their boss, and their boss is going to give them a 100% raise, right? They're going to double your income because the cost of everything you're buying gas electricity food is about the double that's how that works right no you should just quit your job and get on a government welfare program and the government will send you free checks yeah <laughs> yeah yeah all right play the music johnny play us in Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Imports Studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It is I, and there you are, and here I am, and here we are. Since we're all together, wouldn't you say it's our time? Yes, Mr. Hand, I would say it's our time. It is our time to talk about things that are important to us. And one of those things is what, Zach? The Durko Finish Firearm of the Week. Yes, well, before that, though, we're going to remind you, if you are a member of the Discord, if you're a member of the Discord, then you can ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions. And if you ask those questions, and we feel that, that people in our audience may benefit from the answer, then we will well, we'll get right on that, won't we, Zach? Yes, indeed, we will. Zach says we will, and if Zach says we will, then then that's that, Mr. That's That. Hey, you know that flashlight that you're carrying around? Zach carries a flashlight every single day, and what is the name of it? The Stiletto, What's the brand? Right? Bright uh, Strike, Bright right? Strike Stiletto. The Bright no. Strike Stiletto. No, it's not the Stiletto. It's not? No, the Surefire Stiletto. Ours, yeah, ours is oh, the Stiletto. Ex- his is the Executive. Executive. Oh, okay. Thank I, you, I thought Zach, when you Jared looked at it for... last time, you, you said it was a Stiletto. No, oh, mine's a Stiletto. Yours is an Executive. The but mine's executive. all like narrow and stuff. Isn't that what a Welcome. Stiletto is? So uh, I'm looking at a, a product here that looks like it might be about the same size as your Stiletto. No, it's not Stiletto whatever the executive my my executive as i had a i had a terrible tragedy recently i had a terrible tragedy my surefire stiletto that i love so much had it well it broke oh. it, it broke like broke broke like humpty dumpty ain't gonna put that thing together again no more right and it kind of bummed me the the f out, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it hurt my heart, man. It, it like it really hurt my heart. So, 
I, I'd like to get another one. And, and what what's worse is is it it was a uh, a gift. So I've been kind of shopping around looking for new ones. Just buy a replacement. Buy the exact one. Replace. Eh, I know. Oh, so but they are they're still they still are good lights. They they're good lights. It's the Surefire Stiletto. And then they have a Stiletto Pro. Now the Stiletto Pro is aluminium. It has an aluminium um, body. And it's a little bit bigger than the Surefire Stiletto Pocket Light. Uh, I don't know. The I'm still I'm still wavering on what I want to do. <laughs> All right, so questions, answers, all that good stuff. Uh, play us right into the Duracoat finished firearm. So one of the things that we did this weekend uh, is we required all of our students. Uh, and imagine that. You know what, Jared? I, I've... I think that uh, some of them might have been, uh, I don't know, not surprised necessarily, but uh, apparently there are, oh, you know, I know this for a fact. I, I, when I uh, went to the the NRA's instructor courses, I went through the handgun instructor course, the shotgun instructor course, the rifle instructor yeah. course, the RSO course. They were so different back then because you did all of them in one Right, you, you didn't go to one single one. You just did them all in one week. I did them all in a week. Yeah. In in a week, in a week's time. Well, it, we were special because we we had the NRA. What do they? They don't call them. They call them counselors or something weird like that. They, like they they came in, and you know on Monday they put us through the handgun instructor class, and then you know Tuesday the shotgun instructor class, and blah blah blah. Yeah. So basically, in, in in one week's time, we went through. Handgun, shotgun, rifle, and uh, the RSO class. But during those, we never had to get up and actually teach. We just sat in our seats, and the guy up front showed us a bunch of slides and stuff. Yeah. And then they passed out a test, a paper test, and we took the paper test. And as long as we got, I don't know, a 75 or whatever on the paper test, then we got a certificate that says, I are an instructor. Well, in my world of instructor development, that is not enough. Matter of fact, we don't even give a paper test. We don't give a paper test because you're evaluated by the, by the lead instructor, by the master or trainer, uh, which is this guy right here. So, uh, we had one of our, we had all of our students get up and deliver a quick five minute lecture, and then they had to do a fifteen minute presentation, and then they had to actually go on the range, and they had to coach students. Uh, one of our uh, graduates, uh, Don Gregg, owns a company called it's, is it Camo Mountain Firearms? Camo Mountain Arms. Camo Mountain Arms, and uh, his Aurora, Utah, in Utah, or near that, in Utah. Uh, and one of his uh, one of his presentations was about uh, how to duracoat a firearm because that's something that he does. And what I took one of the the things that I took from his uh, from his presentation was that you need to have patience because you need to let the finish cure. A lot of folks out there believe that well, if they can touch it. If they can touch it with their fingers and it's not sticky, right? It, it's not tacky. It doesn't come off. And you're like, oh, I touch it with my fingers. It's dry. Well, yeah, it's dry to the touch, but it hasn't cured yet. It hasn't hardened yet. And when you plan out your firearm refinishing project, whatever it's going to be, you need to plan out, you need to plan to not use that thing for a week or two if you really want the finish to set. You say, well, uh, I know this one company, and they're like, oh, it's, a, it's good immediately because you put it in an oven and you bake it or whatever. Well, see, the, the beauty of Duracoat, 
with its with its hardener is that you do not have to put it in an oven and bake it. Because there are certain things that you might want to put Duracoat on, such as optics. Like whether it's, such as. Yeah, like as in such as. <laughs> uh, polymer. Like, what do you mean? You, you can't bake polymer? Well, if you've got a plastic pistol grip and you've got a plastic stock or a plastic Glock or whatever, I would suggest not putting that in a 250 degree oven for an hour how about you jared what do you, you know you, you don't think <laughs> yeah, what do you know <laughs> if you have a magnified uh rifle scope and you want to put a cool uh multi-cam finish on it or whatever you probably don't want to stick it in an oven for a 250 degree oven for uh, an hour or do you how about your Trigicon? <laughs> How about your, your ACOG or your your RMR? Do you want to put that in an oven at 250 for an hour? I'm guessing no. I'm guessing no. So with Duracoat, because of its hardener, you can put a finish on anything. You can put it on polymer, aluminum, aluminium. You can put it on optics. You can put it on, you know, scopes, whatever. Uh, but you do have to let it dry. You have to let it cure. So patience is a virtue when it comes to stuff like that. You need to, you know, in addition to everything else we've previously talked about, we talked about, you know, you want to prep everything. Use your true strip and, and prep it. Get all of the grease and everything off of it. No grease, no oil, no sand, no grit, no dirt. It needs to be a clean project. And you apply the Duracoat right directly onto the clean project. And then after you do that, you've got to leave it alone. And that might that just might be, Jared, would you say that might be the hardest part? That is for sure the most difficult. Because now that it's, it's, well, it's that it's been done, you're all excited about it. <laughs> and so you want to touch it and you want to carry it and you want to shoot it and you want to take it to the range and you want to do all these things with it, but you got to pump the brakes, Jack, pump the brakes. So the, the moral of today's story for Duracode Finish Firearms is patience is a virtue. And when you're planning to do a project, you say, well, that's a carry gun. Well, okay, get a different carry gun and carry that gun and then let your carry gun cure. And hello to all of you guys in the Duracoat, uh, official Duracoat shop there up in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Hi, guys. Hi. Oh, oh, and I did, speaking of Wisconsin... I enjoyed, thanks to our friend uh, Ken Valier, I enjoyed a Leinenkugel beer this uh, this last weekend. I enjoyed a, a, a cold, tasty beverage from all the way from Wisconsin. Yes, all the way from Wisconsin. All right, moving on. I see that Jared has put a note on in there. So I did. Now, that was directed at Jared. Oh, it was directed at at jared there you go it was directed it was to jared I'm working on sending this p.s <laughs> thank you to ses imports for being the title sponsor for student of the gun radio and if you'd like to know about more about their shotguns or their rifles handguns not rifles but handguns uh go to sds imports that is the gateway and you can click, happily click from there to the Tokarov USA site or the Tisa's USA site. Uh, they got a plethora of handguns and they have a plethora of shotguns. So uh, check those guys out. Uh, what is next on the hit parade? The hit parade. <laughs> oh, Jared was wearing his Juxy shirt this weekend. Weren't you, Jared? Yes. Yes, you were. J-U-X-X-I, Juxi, uh, your story, our technology, a better future, J-U-X-X-I. Share your mind. Is it share your mind? Show your mind. Show your mind. Show it. Show it. Do it. That's what you need to do. Oh. So what else do we have to say? 
Jared, what do, we, do you have anything else to say? I'm in the middle of trying to do something. Right now. Oh, okay. Well, then I will say what I want to say. If you go to juxxi.com, Juxi, and you go to the firearms section, if you go to the firearms section and you uh, sign up to follow, if you subscribe to the Student of the Gun channel, you will see a brand new video that uh, we recently put up. Zach put it up just a couple of days ago. And it is Gun School Gear Checklist. Yes, indeed. It is the Gun School Gear Checklist. And the reason this is important uh, is because, well, I want you guys, when you get to your gun school, to make the most out of it. You see, if you get there and you're having equipment issues, if you're having gear issues when you get to the school, uh, you're not going to be able to focus on training. Because you're going to be, well, what are you going to be focused on? You're going to be focused on, oh, this doesn't work, or, oh, I forgot this, or, oh, I'm cold, or, oh, I'm wet, or, oh, my lips are chapped, or whatever. Take a moment, watch the video. There's a link in the show notes, and uh, that might that just might help you out. Just might help you out. So there you go. That is my recommendation to you recommendation to you guys high point high dash point dot firearms dot net dot m-o-u-s-e dot u-k <laughs> all right let's say dot, it right high dot dash co point firearms dot com dot co dot u-k <laughs> oh yeah well there's actually a dot net and there's a dot com and a dot net did you know that were you aware? We of want that? people to go to high-pointfirearms.com and uh, go from there. And go from there. That's what we want people to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 2023 is coming fast. That is true. Our season for shows, uh, our show season is over for now, but SHOT Show and the Great American Outdoor Show are on the horizon. The YC9 Yeet Cannon is getting closer to completion hydro dip carbines will be rolling out if you haven't visited the website in a while take the time to peruse there you go there you go oh uh, did 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 we get our register i did not get i have an email or no i did not get an email i had to figure it out okay so you got it covered yeah okay it was no no you don't have it covered no for shot show no but we are going to have it covered yes okay okay do, what do they want this year do they want a pint of blood do they, they seems like every year they ask for something else i've been going to the freaking shot show for 20 some years and uh, every year they're like uh we're not sure uh you need to prove that you're you should be on the approved list i'm like do you not have a list of the people who've come for the last 20 years or so? You do? You see my name right there? Yep, that's me. I'm still me. I'm still the same. I'm the same me that I was 20 years ago when I came. And so. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. So much fun. All right, moving on. What are we going to talk about next, kids? I think I should talk about not saying anything and let you guys listen just a little bit louder. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called seven training tips that could save your life. Get instant access by joining the student lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch student of the gun TV, read the blog and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. That much is true. Uh, if you have not gone to studentofthegun.com lately, uh, you can do that. We encourage you to do that. Let's go over to uh, Brownells Bullet Points. Yes, indeed. Brought to you by who else? Brownells. All right. 
right. Bing, bang, boom. Bing, bang, boom. Ba-da-ba-da-ba-doo. Yes, indeed. So, let's see. Where do we begin with this? Uh, well, I guess we can begin by uh, mentioning that I did put a link uh, into the show notes. And this link is not necessary. It's a 25-minute video or 22-and-a-half-minute video, almost 23-minute video. Uh, and it is with my my friend Ken Hackathorn. Uh, I've known Ken for uh, at least 20 years now or so. Uh, I consider Ken to be one of my mentors. Uh, we're, we're very close uh, friends. And... He's, he's been doing this a lot longer than I have. Ken's probably been doing it for, well, I don't want to date you, Ken, but probably 50 years. Going on 50 years, he's been shooting and teaching. And uh, uh, Ken, Ken has the distinct honor of being the firearms instructor that introduced Hunter S. Thompson to the Glock 17. Oh yeah, the year that was the year the first year that the Glock 17 was a, was in the United States when it, they were rare, when they just there was just a few floating around the country, and uh, there there's a picture actually out there on the in the interwebs of Ken standing next to Hunter S. Thompson, and Hunter is holding a Glock 17, and Ken is standing there talking to him. That goes back away. So Ken's been doing this for quite a while. Uh, and uh, he did, uh, you see what he's doing, Jared? He's to call in his, his, his discussions, the master class discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really smart. Uh, so, so Ken and Bill, uh, Bill Wilson, uh, and if you want to see lots of stuff about Ken, uh, you go to Wilson Combat's YouTube channel, uh, and they have... Uh, tons and tons and tons of material there. But they were talking about red dots. And uh, Ken said, he goes, I dared to bring up some of the cons about red dot sites mm -hmm. on pistols. And, and the, the interwebs exploded. He said, he, he, he said <laughs> I think we can say this on public radio. <laughs> he said, the nipple heads on the internet lost their minds. <laughs> Ah. nipple heads i've never heard that one before the nipple heads on the on the internet lost their minds um so, <laughs> so i i listened to the video and i listened to what ken had to say and one thing that he brought up and he said that no one will is willing to bring up is open emitter versus closed emitter red dots this is one all right have you guys been wondering why what the uh the dealio is with the the new crop of red dot sites that look like boxes you know the the original ones look really sleek they have the tower you know and then they have the base and so forth uh, like the original RMR or the original Delta Point or, uh, you know, the original Holosun ones and so on and so forth. And so now the new crop, they look like boxes, right? Well, when you look at a red dot site and you see the red dot in front of you or the green dot or the amber dot or whatever color dot it is you see in front of you, you see that and... You might, if you didn't know any better, if you were a neophyte or whatever, you'd think that the red dot's actually in the glass. Well, we know it's not. The red dot is actually being generated from the base. There's a very small, tiny, there's tiny, tiny little components in there, and it's projecting it. So it's, it's being emitted from the base up onto the glass, and it's reflected back to your eyeball, and that's how you perceive it, right? Well, what Ken brought up is he's like, look, the reality of the fact is, is that junk, gunk, dust, sand, snow, whatever, belly button lint, <laughs> can get into 
uh, can get into the base or onto the base, and it can block the emitter. And if you guys have ever been using a red dot sight, or maybe you haven't used it in a while or whatever, you pull it out, and the dot seems like, like it's broken up or it's hard to see or whatever, or it seems a lot dimmer today than it did last time, or well, it's probably because there's dirt, dust, sand, grit, lint, whatever, blocking that, blocking the emitter. Well, with a, quote, closed emitter system, which is what these little boxes are, all these little boxes you're seeing now, the Holosun one, the Aimpoint has one, it looks like a, like a box. That's a closed emitter system, which means that the emitter's inside and external dust and grit and stuff can't get to it. So the only thing you have to do with that, if you pull it out in your your uh your focal lens focal lens is the one that's close to your eye objective lens is the one that's close to the object that's how you remember that object objective focal is up here uh so all you have to do is you know take a rag or your thumb or whatever wipe it off and boop your bob's your uncle now you're ready to go uh ken brought that up i have not heard people talking about that jared have you no you know people like uh, now uh, Ken, to this point, yeah, Ken brought up some other stuff, which is you know good point. But I discovered something this weekend that uh, I actually hadn't planned on discovering. I'm going to show you guys right now. If you're watching at home, you just saw me put on my spectacles. Now my spectacles. These spectacles on my face are actually trifocals, right? Or what they call transition lenses. So the bottom is close, and the middle is mid, and then the top is long distance, right? I thought transition lenses were the ones that turn into sunglasses. Well, these, well, these are them too, but to, well, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's what it is because I have those on mine. Try focal. Tri that would be confusing if they had two different, the same word meant two different things. A trifocal lens, uh, basic trifocal lens. Do you want transition lenses? Well, I do yeah, have transition actually, lenses. I would love that. And then you get them and they're, they're trifocals and you're like, this is one I asked for. Mm, trifocal lenses. Da, 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 da. All right. Well, maybe I misspoke because these actually are, they turn into sunglasses both, too. Yeah. They turn into sunglasses, and they're also trifocal lenses. Uh, but my point is this, is, and these are fine. I have a set of shooting glasses that are wraparound, that are prescription, that are single lens, right? There's no strong, medium, whatever. There's no bifocal, no trifocal, whatever. Now, what I noticed when I got these is when I punch out a pistol, right? I punch out a pistol, now the front sight, now when you punch out a pistol, do you raise your head up like this or do you lower your head? You, you tuck your chin, right? When you punch a pistol out in front of your face, you tuck your chin. What does that do if you've got trifocals? That puts the distance vision part in front of your eye. So now the front sight is blurry. If I take my glasses off and I hold out a pistol, the front sight is perfectly clear in my vision. This is what I noticed yesterday. I was at an indoor range and I was using a uh, a Century Arms a, a Mete, the mechanic, mechanic Mete, the Mete, with and it had a Shield brand red dot optic on it. And you know what? It worked. It worked fine. It worked perfectly fine. The red dot was clear. No matter where you're looking. No matter, yeah. The red dot was clear in my vision. I didn't have an issue with the, like I would with the front sight. Remember when I told you about uh, training the, the girl with, that had macular degeneration? Yep. And she was, she, she would look at, she would try and focus on the front sight and it would blur out or she would see two. She would like see double. If she tried to look at the iron front sight, she'd see it, 
but then it would split and it, she would have like double vision and so forth. And if she winked her eye, it would be blurry and so on and so forth. So I pulled the charging or the carrying handle off her gun and I slapped an EOTech on it. And I said, just use the red dot image that you see, put that on the target, press the trigger. We, we did that and she shot fantastically well. It's human vision. So one of the, the benefits, one of the big benefits of a red dot sight uh, to people who shoot, who actually shoot, is vision issues. It helps with vision issues. It actually improves your ability to see it. Now, the trick is, if for people that don't shoot, and this is what Ken brought up in his video. You guys can listen to it. on. It's like I said, it's 22, almost 23 minutes. Uh, and it's well worth listening to. I was going to say, Ken is one of those guys where it's worth listening to every second of his videos. Yeah, yeah, it's worth listening to it. The trick is, is you know, Ken said, if, if you're one of these guys that shoots 100 rounds a year, and you're like, I'm going to put a red dot on my gun because that'll, that'll make it more accurate and I'll be able to shoot better. He's like, you shoot 100 rounds a year. There's nothing that you can strap on, bolt on, screw on, bang on to your gun that's going to make you shoot better. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if you're, you're <laughs> well, every once in a while, maybe, you know, once a year, my buddies and I, we go out and we shoot our guns. There's nothing that you can attach to that gun red dot laser tritium sight that's going to make you shoot better because you don't freaking shoot <laughs> and you see that's the the conundrum jared is uh, how do you how do you help somebody or recommend a gear selection to someone you know we're big fans of the night fission tritium sights the night vision accurate tritium sights for g locks or shields or you know whatever your g48 your g43 your g17 you know we're big fans of those we believe that they're a good site setup i know they're a good site setup because i've been there done that gotten the uh would you say that the designer of those is kind of knows how to design things yeah okay. so but if you don't shoot your gun you don't you've never got taken training and you're self-taught and every once in a while you shoot your gun there's nothing that really is going to help you uh because you're not serious about it so you know how do you jared and fans in the audience and zach and how do you help somebody how do you make a gear recommendation to someone who doesn't train and, or practice you don't you because tell them to come to our classes <laughs> there's a piece of gear that you can use that will help you shoot 600 rounds per year minimum it's called the one box workout and all it takes it'll cost you 25 bucks a month in ammo maybe 30 yeah maybe 30 depending on what ammo you're getting as, as training ammo Right, so you can do actually it's yeah. So with one box of fifty rounds, we've developed a uh, training regimen that you can do, or a practice regimen that you can do by yourself at your range. And you will, through that regimen, you will be able to identify things that you need help with, and then search out uh, ways to fix that. Obviously, we recommend training. And that's why I changed it from training to practice, right? We recommend yeah. training, which is done under the watchful eye of an instructor. Practice is what you do after you go to a training class. You go home and you practice the things that you learned. Yes. You cannot train yourself. You can practice with yourself. Yes, you can practice. You yourself can practice. Um, and, and and practice is the, is the deliberate mastery, the deliberate and purposeful action that you take uh, when you're attempting to master a subject, whether it's piano or guitar or shooting or whatever. You can go to oneboxworkout.com, O-N-E, boxworkout.com. Yeah, oneboxworkout.com. So, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I, I, 
that's a good video. I'm not going to belabor uh, the discussion, but I thought that those points right there were worth discussing. And, and if you're relatively new in the game and you haven't really thought that deeply about it, you might be thinking, what's the story with these boxy looking red dots? And uh, a lot of people will say, I don't like the way that looks. It, it, it's bigger and it takes up more room on the gun and yada yada i'm going to give you guys a a a, uh, a very real a reality check the special operations guys have been working with dot optics on handguns for probably going on 15 years now and one of the things that they did and actually we we did this year we Remember when we when I bought that adapter plate and mounted the the T1 on a Glock? Yeah, way back when. One of the reasons that they before that, it was cool. Yeah, before it was cool that that they mounted a uh an Aimpoint T1 micro T1 onto a pistol was because it's a and the I know the guys at Fort Bragg were were doing this and they were testing it to see what it was like is because that's a closed emitter system. And it's also an extremely durable product. The T1 is is like rhinoceros tough, right? So the problem with that, though, is the weight. See, the problem with something like, a, like putting a T1 or an H1 on a pistol slide is now you're adding additional weight to the slide, so you're affecting the, the speed of the slide, and depending on the ammunition it may or may not cycle that with that i had a problem if it was relatively light recoiling ammo then i would i had some issues that's the only time i ever had that um if i use plus p or duty if i use the expensive duty caliber stuff i didn't have any issues but i i don't really want to use a thousand rounds of hydroshock to train i don't have that kind of cash on me i don't have those kind of ducats so that is something to think about. So take that, take that little coin, put it in your pocket, and uh, use it for what it's worth. All right, Zach, it's all yours. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed. ShopSOTG.com is where you can get all the best stuff in the world, including the new... Uh, whatchamacallit? What do we call it? The SOTG official icon patch. Sorry, I'm trying to fix something real quick, and it's yep. not cooperating with me. Yep, yeah, the, the official... official icon patch. Yes, indeed. It, uh, you guys were asking about it. We were, we finally got it done. We were teasing it for a while. We stopped teasing it, but now it is here. If you could look on the screen right now, boom! That's what it looks like. Look how pretty it is. Yeah, there you go. It's got color. It's got texture. It's got Velcro on the back, so it's perfect for your helmet, backpack, vest, whatever you want to get. Jacket. Yeah, and it's a little over it. three Just... inches, so it's not huge, but it's a good little size. Yeah. There you so, go. Yeah, over at shopsotg.com. It's on the homepage. You can grab yourself an official SOTG icon patch if you want to. And I think with the hope that you would. Yes. And the people who attended our class this weekend uh, were given, all of our instructors, uh, when they were given their certificates, they all, they all got one of the new patches. They did. Yes. And Nick yes, just asked did. a question that I meant to answer. Uh, if you pre-ordered yours, which was a grad program exclusive, they got a special pre-order and a special discount. Uh, those went out on taste Tuesday, so I think they went out on Friday. So you yeah, should be getting them went any out. moment now. Uh, Phil Paxton's already he already posted a picture of his. Yeah. So Nick, you should be getting yours soon. Yeah. So watch your watch the mail closely because they should they they'll be arriving today or tomorrow. They should be there. All right. Before we move on, Jared wants to uh, give you a quick teaser about our uh, uh, tomorrow's fighting fitness segment. We Ooh, yeah, we're gonna be talking about. Uh, the importance of nutrition and improved psychiatric and mental health outcomes. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about how omega-3, 6 ratios affect the brain. And this is done. It's it, This video that we're referencing is a uh, two-and-a-half-hour presentation by Dr. Hiblin, 
Uh, you can do some research on him and figure out who he is. There's there's a line of credentials there, uh, but there's some very interesting information that was presented in the study that actually explains some of the stuff that we've been talking about. So we're going to hit on that tomorrow on the Fighting Fitness segment of bonus hour number one. Yeah, you want to be there. So get SOTG.com. Get SOTG.com. All right, let's move on to the, we want to talk about bears. Yeah, talking about bears. What about Beats and Battlestar Galactica? Nope, just we're, no Beats, no Battlestar Galactica, only bears. Do, 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 do. That's right. That is the uh, official intro music for the Crossbreed Holster Student of the Gun Homeroom. And it is Dangerous by Madison Rising. And if you guys go over to crossbreedholsters.com, uh, you want to use the promotional code SOTG, or you can just go directly uh, from the link that is in the show notes. You can click directly from there. It'll take you where you need to go. All right, we got... Uh, Jeez, Louise. So last week, we had a story from AmmoLand.com that we were going to talk about, but we ran out of time. We just did not have enough time. So this is from October 16th, 2022, Dean Weingarten, and he's talking about 22 mag against bears. On Tuesday, August, not October, on Tuesday, August 30th, at about 6.50 p.m., James Little settled into campsite 674 in the Boundary Waters canoe area. His youngest child was a few feet away. His youngest cried out, and James grabbed the child. He took a couple steps, uncertain of what had happened. Then his oldest yelled, Bear! And James turned around. The bear was about six feet from him. It had been within three to four feet of his back when the child was startled. That's crazy close. Yeah. It's like within arm's distance. This was the start of the remarkable, remarkable incident. In James's words, just finished a trip to Horseshoe that should have been three nights, but turned to one. I had a bear walk right into camp and within four feet of my youngest. Nothing would discourage him till I fired a couple of rounds. We packed up and bolted to an open site, campsite 677. So they started at 674. They went to campsite 677, which was a half a mile away on the other side of the lake. We weren't there five minutes and was pulling up the food bag and my wife screamed. There was another bear 15 feet away heading to our canoe with our kids in it. I had to fire another round before he would be deterred. I wonder if it was the same bear. Uh, I don't know. It might have been. Left that site and unexpected BC, BWCA, which is a campground, uh, member Ossible and his crew took my family and me for in for the night. It's campsite 672. Early the next morning, we broke and came out. We broke camp and headed out. Sorry, there's some misspellings here that I'm yeah. going to have to work around. My family had had too much across the portage from Caribou to Liz, campsite 645. The campers there had their breakfast intruded upon by a bear who would not be deterred till he had taken their food bag. If you're wondering what a food bag is, it's it's uh, when when people go to the woods and they take they put their food in a food bag and they like throw a, a rope over a limb of a tree or something and then they they uh, haul it up. So, so they did they did the right thing that people recommend doing for bears. Well, they shouldn't have took food with them. Yeah, they, well, they shouldn't have yeah, had food. They shouldn't or... even eat food. The correspondent talked <clears throat> to James, who reported the incident to the BWCA authorities. James used a North American Arms mini revolver, the Wasp bottle, in twenty two Magnum with a 1 and 5 eighths inch barrel. The revolver was loaded with spear gold dot defensive ammunition. <sighs> James was certain there were two bears, not one. Mm -hmm. There's your answer. To reach campsite 677 in time, the first bear would have had to swim across the lake. The second bear was not wet. Both bears were adults weighing over 200 pounds. In James's estimation, the bears were in the 300-pound range. It's a 
stick there. Okay, this is in Minnesota. Yeah. In case you're wondering, you're like, where the heck is the BWCA camp area? It's in Minnesota. With the first bear, when James fired the warning shot, the bear ran off about 100 yards, then stopped and looked back. James fired a second warning shot, and the bear ran out of sight. The 22 Magnum mini revolvers are quite loud. Yeah. At campsite 677, which was the second one, the second bear came within six feet, retreated, came back, and moved toward the canoe where the children were. That is when James fired a warning shot in the second encounter. So where did the bullets go? At the, I don't know. Not into the children, which is good. Mm. At the warning shot, the bear retreated to the sounding, surrounding forest. Acknowledged bear expert Stephen Herrero considered just such a possibility when musing about the utility of firearms as a defense against bear. The advice has remained the same since 1981 from Bear Attacks 3rd Edition, 2018. Page 243. A firearm is also useful when a very aggressive bear shows up around camp and cannot be persuaded to leave. Such bears normally have a history of feeding on people's food or garbage and may have to be killed. <laughs> Here's what I love. I, I love modern experts are like, uh, we did a study and uh, we concluded that a firearm may be, it, it may be a useful tool. Uh, for aggressive, for dealing with aggressive bears. You, you did a study about that? You did? How much money, How much did you spend on that study to, to determine that uh, a firearm may be useful as a defensive tool against an aggressive bear? <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Uh, in James' case, the bears were sufficiently startled by the warning shots to run off. Whether the bears would have returned is uncertain. James's wife questioned the utility of a firearm on a camping trip. Now she is glad that James was armed. <laughs> yeah, this dude needs a different wife. In about 10% of documented cases where a pistol was fired in, defensive, in defense against bears, warning shots were sufficient. Mm -hmm. 10%. 10%. So that some, means 90% they weren't. Yes. Yeah, some cases are uncertain because people aimed at the bear, but it could not be determined if the, it had been hit. Mm-hmm. It is likely that one of the two bears scared off by James's pistol shots uh, stole the food supply of the campers at six four five campsite. So here's one. It says one of the correspondents' colleagues related an incident thirty plus years ago in which warning shots from a forty one Magnum worked to dissuade a grizzly bear because there was no precise date or location. The incident is not considered to be documented. Um. Let me go ahead and as a dude who's been carrying and using firearms for a few years now, uh, a 41 Magnum, unless it was a, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and go on record and say this was a revolver. Uh, th uh, there have been 41 Magnum semi-automatic guns, but they're about as rare as hen's teeth um, or unicorns. What do you do? If you have launched rounds into the air or into a tree or into the ground or whatever, you know that revolvers hold a finite amount of ammunition, right? Nah, -uh. and seen a movie. The twenty-two Magnum mini revolvers from North American Arms own a, hold a finite amount of. I think the mini revolvers hold five, four, or five. Uh, I'm pretty pretty positive they don't hold six. Um, but uh, kids, what do you do if your bluff, if the bear calls your bluff? What do you mean the bear calls my bluff? Well, you you pop some rounds, you know, pop around into the tree. Uh, or, you know, into the air or whatever. And the bear decides that he's not impressed and he's just going to go ahead and keep on coming and, and eat you. <laughs> well, well, what do you mean, Paul? Well, you've just, <laughs> you just expended 25% of your, of your load 
into the air or in okay according to this the standard 22 m mini revolver holds five shots total of ammunition and let me tell you what you're not going to speed reload one of these guns uh you get five and that's it so well i mean i mean what I mean, what do you do if the bear's not impressed and decides to just keep going? Or what are you going to do if you're the dad and the bear decides, hey, this small child looks like it would be a good meal? And we just last week, we talked, we did the Connecticut story last week, right? But the, the, the grandpa is watching his, his 10 year old play in the backyard, and the black bear comes up, grabs the 10 year old by the leg, and it's like, here, here we go. What if the bear grabs your kid? And says this this looks like a good meal and and now you have three shots of 22 magnum left to stop the bear from eating your kid or let's say you have a 41 magnum and you fire one or two rounds of 41 to try and scare the bear and it decides it's going to take your kid and leave now you have you've expended 25 40 percent you know of your ammo trying to scare the bear Oh, it hurts my head. It hurts my head. You say, all right, but that's just one incident. And according to Mr. Pogue, the wildlife expert, this never happens and it's extremely rare. And you're never going to need a firearm to defend yourself against a bear. Because Mr. remember, Mr. Pogue has been going to the woods for 30 years and never one time had to use a firearm. So that proves it. College wrestler saves teammate from grizzly bear mauling in Wyoming. This is WTHR.com, and it dateline is. I thought you were going to say WTF.com. Yeah. <laughs> October 18th, 2022. Just happened. This is the group apparently surprised the grizzly bear while searching for antlers shed by elk and deer in the forest southeast of Yellowstone National Park. The dateline for the story, it says New York, but it happened in wyoming a college wrestler from a small wyoming school helped his teammates survive a grizzly mauling over the weekend by trying to wrestle the massive bear off of his friend eventually drawing a more brutal attack to himself the men are crediting their bonds as wrestling teammates at northwest college in cody wyoming with helping them survive the attack saturday evening southeast of yellowstone national park Brady Lowry of Cedar City, Utah, suffered a broken arm and puncture wounds in the initial attack after they surprised the bear while searching for antlers shed by elk and deer in the Shoshone National Forest. Uh, Lowry told KSL-TV that it shook me around and I didn't know what to do. I curled up in a ball and it got me a few more times. He was from the movie Without a Paddle. <laughs> His teammate, Kendall Cummings of Evanston, Wyoming, tried to stop the attack on Lowry by yelling and kicking and hitting the bear and pulling on its fur. I didn't want to lose my friend. It was bad, Cummings told the Ezra News. There was a big old bear on top of him. I could have run and potentially lost a friend or get him off and save him. The bear quickly turned its fury onto Cummings. Uh, Cummings told KSL that it tackled me, chewed me up a bit, and then when it was done, wandered off. And I started calling out for Brady to make sure he was all right. It's just like, like, okay, I'm done with you. I'm leaving. Yeah, bear. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah. The bear was only gone briefly. The bear circled back around and it got me again, chewed on me. And that's when it got my head and cheek. Coming like said, this is all right. Jared, do you remember we were, when we read the stories about the, uh, the, well, the one in Montana, where the bear came and then left yep, and, then, came and then it came back. There's another one in Alaska where they, the woman thought she had scared it off. And then 10 minutes later, it showed up in a different place. Bears are hunters. You guys understand this bear as animals are hunters. And this is actually very common. You think, Oh, whew, that was a close one. The bear left. It's bored or I scared it and now it's going to leave. No, actually what it's going to do is it's going to come at you from a different direction because they're hunters. 
and it's very this is very common this is very common so just keep that in mind if you're ever in a situation like this and you yell at the bear or you throw a stick at it or you waste half your ammo shooting in the air or whatever and it takes off it's finding a better way then you're like oh whew. yeah that, that was, was cl close. that was a close one no what it's doing is it's going it's trying to find a different way to get you it's gonna circle back around it's going to circle back around it's like it's like uh, that little chucky doll that was the head liar for biden let's circle back it's going to circle back and then it's going to kill you no it's not bears would never do that they're just curious creatures and you notice what these kids didn't have it didn't say that they're they had food and they should never have food i, I like how they're like they how they the the story puts it on them they surprised it how do you know that how does the people how do they know that did they interview the bear so later on they found the bear and they said mr bear and there's like i was just taking a dump in the woods and next thing i know these kids are right there it shocked me i was like what the like well uh, it surprised me how do they know it's and, funny and why why do we feel the need to always put the blame on the victims of the attack here why do we always feel the need to victim shame nobody victim shamed it was just a statement of probably fact how how do you know that we we don't you don't know that but it wasn't victim shaming all right they surprised it they didn't say that that's the initial attack surprised at, the bear. here's all right you want to argue with me that's cool it says right here suffered aft wounds after they surprised the bear how does anyone know that there's no negative what evidence for that. what evidence is there that they surprised it that they walked up on a bear and then it attacked them. How do they know the bear wasn't waiting for him to get close? Is he just waiting in the in the. Wings? How do they know it wasn't crouching down? Wait, you don't. You know how well a bear smells. How well their sense of no, smell they smell operates. Bad. They don't smell good. <sighs> Cummings pulled himself up and began looking for his teammate. In the meantime, Lowry was able to walk to an area with cell phone service and call nine one one. Two other teammates, August Harrison of Vernal, Utah, and Oren Jackson of Kersey, Colorado, helped the badly injured Cummings off the mountain. Carried him at times. Lowry was able to walk by himself. Both ended up at Billings Clinic Hospital where Cummings went underwent surgery. Neither man was listed as a patient there on Tuesday. Hospital spokesperson Zach Benoit said, other members of the wrestling team joined coach Jim Ziegler at the hospital to support their injured teammates. Uh, Ziegler said, I'm proud of them just the way that they love each other, the way that they protected each other and the way they stuck together. I can't imagine the horror and the terror of it. I don't think they realized until after it was over how frightening it was. They just did what they did, helped each other survive and they lived to tell about it. And I'm proud of them. There you go. All right. So that is, so we've got the, uh, the 22 magnum story all right which we brought and we've got this story apparently no one well according to this story uh unless they just left it out no one in this group of of college students was armed with anything okay so now we got a story that lit that just there was there's the japan story did you, that, which is famous because the the uh, Japanese guy who's a mountain climber in Japan and he had a GoPro on his head or his helmet or whatever, and uh, everybody's talking about it because uh, this bear attacked him and, and he kicked it and screamed at it and everything. Uh, but that was Japan, and they they don't have an option for self defense there. So if you're going to be hiking around in Japan, I guess you just use a GoPro to stop bears from eating you. But we got a story here from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Uh, Gatlinburg, and this just happened yesterday. So, so <laughs> this seems to be an epidemic. It seems kind of like an epidemic of bear attacks uh, that never happen, and it's so rare that you shouldn't even worry about it. So this guy here, he really screwed up because he was in his cabin. 
wonder how they're going to victim shame this guy. I wonder how the Bambi police are going to. Well, he shouldn't have been in a cabin where bears live, in an area where bears live. You should have known better. All right, what's the story there? What's what's the deal, Jared? Uh, TWRA, this is the same site, WTHR.com. TWRA, manhunt after black bear enters Gatlinburg rental cabin. Bear caught and euthanized. The bear entered the cabin through a set of locked but not deadbolted French doors. <laughs> according to twra which is the tennessee wildlife resources agency see tennessee wildlife resources agency is the reporting agency the the story is from wthr.com yeah gatlinburg tennessee a man vacationing in a gatlinburg cabin was injured by a black bear that entered his home or entered the home in the middle of the night on saturday TWRA said that the incident occurred at a rental cabin in the downtown vicinity after 11 p.m. Hold on a second. The where? Downtown vicinity. You mean he wasn't out in the middle of the nowhere in the woods in the bears? He wasn't in the bears property and he should have known better than to go where the bears live. He was in town. Well, if the bear walks into the cabin, is, is it then the bears cabin? Uh, if he's a squatter in California, yeah, I guess the, the man walked into the kitchen to find that the black bear had entered through a set of locked but not dead bolted French doors. The bear charged the man and swatted at him, causing serious injuries to his face and the top of his head, probably because he startled the bear. Yeah, he sh he it was his fault. He surprised it. The bear also scratched him across his back as he well, that probably felt good as he went into the bedroom where he locked himself in and called nine one one. Police and EMS responded to the scene, but the man refused medical treatment. The man was later driven by family members to a local hospital where he's treated and released. A trap was set at the scene and a bear fitting the description was caught and euthanized early Sunday afternoon. The bear was a two or three year old female without cubs weighing 209 pounds. Hair samples were sent for DNA analysis and her claws were swabbed for human hemoglobin. The results are expected this week. TWRA explained that the wildlife officers had not received any recent reports of bear complaints in this specific area. However, numerous bears inhabit Gatlinburg and other cities around the park. All right, where? What city was it? Oh, it was Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where the 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 wife's like, "Hey, what's that noise?" And she goes downstairs, and there's a bear in the kitchen. Oh yeah. And screams and, and they're like and the it was trying to get to them. Uh, so here we go. So the TWRA has some advice for you people out there to prevent bear attacks. Jared, give the advice, please. Never feed or approach bears. Secure food, garbage, and recycling. Remove bird feeders when bears are active. Never leave pet food outdoors clean and store grills alert neighbors to bear activity how would any of these things stop this dude from getting attacked in the kitchen of the cabin well if he secured his food gar food garbage and recycling and removed the bird feeders and never let pet food outdoors and clean and store his grill then maybe the bear wouldn't have come in yep well, he sh if he wouldn't, if he never fed or approached the bear, if he never approached the bear, he would have, he would not have been attacked. Yeah. So you're sleeping and you hear like <laughs> crash and you're like, holy yeah, shit, something's in the right house. right there in bed. And then if you alert your neighbors to bear activity, um, the neighbor, oh, this is what, this is what it is. The neighbors, they didn't alert him. Distract the bear and then they'll go attack the neighbors instead. Well, maybe the neighbors failed him by not telling him there was bears. <sighs> Is there another one? <laughs> Driver delivering Amazon found dead. Oh, holy crap balls. Is this a new one? This is over there by you, Mr. Voltmer. Holy crap. This just, this just happened. In Missouri, 
updated on October 25th. It That's says, today. Driver delivering for Amazon found dead after sus suspected animal attack in Excelsior Springs. The Ray County Sheriff's Office is investigating after a driver delivering for Amazon was found dead following a suspected animal attack on Monday night. Ray County deputies responded to a call about, about an Amazon truck that had been parked in front of a house off Highway 0 for several hours, or Highway O, I'm not sure. Oh. When deputies arrived, they found the driver dead in the front yard. The sheriff's office said the victim had injuries consistent with an animal attack and two dogs were spotted on scene that appeared to be aggressive. Oh, it was it was probably animals. It was probably dogs then. Due to the fact that the nature of some of the injuries to the male driver, we can't confirm or deny if this were if they were the cause of the death of the driver. However, we wanted to be safe. Deputies shot one dog which went in through a door dog door and the firearm deputy or I mean the fire department said that they could hear dogs in the house with blood absorbed on the dog door. Mm. Okay. Whew. Wasn't a bear attack. It was a dog attack. We know somebody that's in Excelsior Springs that uh, has a, a do neighbor's dogs are killing his chickens or were killing his chickens. I don't know if they still are. But. What's up with you rednecks having these violent dogs? Jared, have we ever owned a dog that would kill people? We've we owned dogs your whole life. We've owned a couple that wanted to kill people, but they couldn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because they were like yeah. ten pounds. Yeah, don't pretend but, Snickers wouldn't have killed somebody if he could have. Oh, yeah, he's only ten pounds. Yeah, but uh, wow, just wow. Oh yeah, two miles from his house was where that happened. Wow. So there well, you go. He, he said, "Not anymore. The dogs aren't killing chickens anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, not anymore." Yeah. Yeah, it is because we're talking about animal attacks and also something for everyone to think about is if you're a delivery driver or whatever, you know. No, it, it's they're one not of the, allowed. Yeah. Their, their company policy says they're forbidden to have any type of weapon on their body. But does your company policy say that you're allowed to die? Yes, because they don't care. Because the company companies that tell you you have to be disarmed don't care if you die. They care about their bottom line and they care about their insurance. They do not care if you die. You are disposable. They'll hire someone to replace you tomorrow. Sorry, that's reality. A, a company policy that says you are forbidden to have any type of weapon, knife, gun, nothing, anything on your body when you're working for us means that they don't care about you. You are disposable. Uh, they're more concerned about their own liability, and if you die, then you die, and that's just too bad. And we'll cry at your funeral. People will feel sorry for us, and then we'll hire someone to replace you. All right, let's talk about pop music. Uh, how how are we doing on time? We are one hour and thirteen minutes in, so you got time. Okay. All right, so we had the first ever Student of the Gun develop instructor development course. It ran Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of uh, this last week here in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. We had nine uh, students in the class, and I believe, from my perspective, that it went very, very well. Uh, everybody was attentive. Everybody was, and we didn't expect it not to be. It was an invitation only class. <laughs> we stacked the deck. <laughs> we we stacked the deck. We we invited grad program members. Uh, uh, we sent a, an invitation out about a month or two ago to grad program members, uh, and invited them to come. And many of them did come. Uh, we had people from Wisconsin. Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas, Utah, Washington State, and I guess that's it, right? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, because we had we had multiple from Utah, multiple from Washington, Missouri, Tennessee, Missouri, Missouri, Arkansas, and Wisconsin. So, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody uh, who attended. Are uh, you guys who attended? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm yeah, a great class. I'm going to let because I am older than Jared. I'm going to let him go first and give his impressions of the class because he was there the whole time. Yeah, uh, my impressions of the class are: it was good. 
Is that a good enough impression? No, you're taking my coffee? It's cold. Guys, it's guys, cold you that you, can't see. It's cold and you haven't been drinking it. Yes, I have. You guys, those of you that can't see, he just <sighs> stole some of my coffee. It's okay, though. It's no, okay. So the class was, um, I was actually a student in the class. And so I shut my mouth and I listened to what dad had to say. And he does a very good job at delivering material in a way that even his his son with a thick head can understand it. Who's um, and my son who's heard everything I've said already. Yeah, I learned something new because at the end of the class, we go through a review. It's like, okay, hey, did you learn anything? What did you learn that you didn't know on Friday when the class started? And I was thinking about it. And there were, there were quite a few things that um, were floating through my head, but most of it I had already heard. It was just reinforcing the things that I'd already heard. Um, one of the things that I learned was that um, if you don't deliver information to a student in a way that they can understand it, they're not going to listen. So you have to, it's it's not about you knowing how to do it. It's about you being able to take that information, package it in a way to the student who you're teaching. And it could, and different people learn different ways, but package it in a way that they can understand that thing that you're saying. And if it doesn't land the first time, change up the way, the delivery method and maybe it'll land that way. Uh, but the one thing that I that I uh, didn't hear you say ever before in my life was breaking down the different types of um, instructor, coach, te uh, teachers, and mentors. I don't know what you want to call that. Different types of educators. educators. Yeah, mm -hmm. different types of educators where you have the instructor who's the, 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 pro the master instructor who's leading the class. Then you have the coaches who are more of like a, um, a friend type person for lack of a better term where they actually are more focused on be being there for each individual student rather than the class as a whole. And they're actually delivering pointers one-on-one -on -one going down the line in a shooting class. You'd be going down the line, making corrections to an individual student. Uh, and then we went into what, what a teacher is and, and what they do. And then a mentor, which is, I don't think a mentor is really part of the like, okay, instructor, a coach and a teacher are the ones that are really delivering the information with the intent of educating the, the people in that class, right? The mentor is what a mentor does is they choose. They're very selective of the, the student that they choose and it goes past the class. They become a mentor and they, they continue to to mentor the student after the class ends, if that makes sense. A mentor is a long term personal relationship yeah. and you can you can and I'm sure that you have in your life at some point in time, you have paid people or hired people to coach you, uh, or you paid for instruction. You know, you you pay for a, a seat in a class and so essentially you're paying the instructor to teach you. Uh, you, you sign up with Barbell Logic online coaching and you pay for a coach to give you pointers and so on and so forth. That, that situation is, it's, it's a professional situation. It's a professional, uh, arrangement, but here's what you cannot do. And here's what does not happen. You can't pay someone to mentor you. You see, because mentorship is, is beyond money. When someone, and, and when a person gives you their time and experience and knowledge and attention through mentorship, that is, that's something that you can't buy. It can only be given to you by that person because they're giving you the most valuable thing that they have. They're giving you their time. Your payment does not come in the form of money to the mentor, yep. your payment comes in the form of becoming the mentor for other people. Because if you think about it, and um, mentors will have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of experience that they're imparting to you, and uh, then it becomes your goal, your, <laughs> your responsibility, your responsibility yep. to take that information and make sure it continues. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, we were talking about that in the class, and I was talking about it to Jared one on one. I've I've been extremely fortunate in my life to have uh, several people who were experts in their area of endeavor uh, to take me on uh, 
and as a I guess as a Padawan, as a prodigy, you know, as a protege or whatever, and be my mentors. And the the agreement, the unspoken agreement, and, and that's the thing is, it, there's an unspoken agreement between the mentor and, and the protege, and that is someday it will be your responsibility to step up and ment- and be the mentor for someone else. Uh, and, you know, some of my mentors, you know, my original mentors, I've, ha- I've had people uh, mentor me for 30-plus years now. And some of those guys are gone. Some of those guys have finished their journey uh, and they've moved on. And so the... The agreement, the unspoken agreement that's made between the mentor and the protege is that someday it's going to be your responsibility. Someday you're going to have to step up and do it. Uh, and that's what you, that is the duty that, uh, that you owe to them. If anyone has, has ever taken the time to mentor you, the, the duty and the payment that you owe them is that someday uh, you're going to have to do it. It's going to be your responsibility. And it is a, it is a big responsibility uh, because you have to you have to consider how and you know you're going to do it. And the only way to actually mentor someone is to become the what well, you know the ultimate student of that subject and to have greater than average knowledge of that subject and greater than average experience about that subject. So, uh, and then that's just, you know, we, that was the whole, that was part of the educators lesson. You know, we had a topic about educators and understanding and, and you know, what's sad to me, Jared is I've had, I've had numerous, I've gone through numerous, instructor training instructor development i went through a college class where the whole thing was all about Mm -hmm. becoming an instructor becoming a teacher you know and so forth and um and i i've had coaching instruction and i've had platform instruct you know teaching uh, how to be a platform instructor how to deliver information how to be a, a a range coach how to teach but never in any of those programs did the person at the front of the room ever break down the mentor protege responsibility in discussion yeah i don't know maybe you've heard it before but nope. i never had nope that was the first time um and one of the things that was challenging for me was teaching a physical skill because a lot of the stuff that most of my core knowledge that I do every single day is based around concepts. It's, it's more conceptual than it is physical. And so the, the difficult part for me was actually learning to teach a physical skill because it's different than teaching a conceptual skill, right? With concepts, you just, you need to make sure the person understands the concept then they can apply that concept. However, they see fit to make it actually work in real life. With a physical skill, there are, like, my second block of instruction was about disassembly and reassembly of a Glock. And I, as I was teaching the curriculum, I was thinking, man, this really doesn't need to be a 10-step process. But in reality, it actually probably needed to be about a 20-step process because when you're teaching somebody that's never done it before to do something physical – You've got to hit on those little tiny pieces of th- uh, the tiny things that you do to make the action smooth. And it really for that's part. I really believe that teaching is one of the most important parts of mastery. Because oh, it absolutely is. You're really examining the why and the how behind the action that you're teaching to figure out, okay, is this really, really necessary to teach this person to accomplish the goal that we're trying to achieve? And if it's not necessary, you throw it out. But in order to make that decision, you really have to break down the process of the thing into literal step-by-step instructions. And then you you look at that, you analyze the instructions that you've written out, and you say, okay, is this necessary? Do they really need to know this to accomplish the goal? Yes, okay, keep it. No, then throw it away. And then what you're doing is you're figuring out the 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 most optimized way to teach and deliver the information. 
but the fundamentals of teaching a physical skill are another thing that I've heard you talk about, but it was never packaged in a way that I actually had to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And there are certain fundamentals of, of teaching a physical skill, uh, that you, and one of the, the things that I tried to stress upon, uh, the instructors, the the students in the instructor class is that there's a big, well, there's a tremendous difference between you knowing how to do something and you being able to teach another person how to do that thing. Just because you know how to do something or just because you do something a lot does not mean, uh, it doesn't automatically make you an instructor or a teacher or a coach or whatever. If you're like, oh, I know how to do that, so I'm just going to show other people how to do it. Yeah, but there's, there's, there's so much more to it than that. Uh, it's the way, like I said, Jared, before we talked about, it's the monkey see monkey do thing. It's like, well, just, just mimic me. Just do what I do. Watch me and do what I do. But see, not everybody can learn like that. Not everybody, and everybody, uh, learns the same way. They're like, what do you mean? Not everybody learns the same way. Yeah, they do. No, they don't actually, uh, people's brains are wired a little bit differently and so, people learn better in different ways. And that's one of the things that we break down on day one is uh, we need to understand that when we have a class of people in front of us, that not every single person in the, in the audience uh, is going to uh, either A, learn the way we learn, uh, and there are going to be people in the audience that learn differently from each other or learn better differently from each other. I mean, if you've ever had somebody, if you're like telling someone to do something and they're just not getting it and you're, and you look at yourself or you're, you're like beating your head. You're like, how do you not get this? <laughs> how do you not understand what I'm showing you? Well, it's because not everybody thinks, you know, not everyone's brain works the exact same way as your brain does. So, and we're going to talk about that in great detail tomorrow <laughs> about how some people's brains don't even work at all yeah. uh, or work very poorly. Uh, so uh, now if you include the POIs, mm -hmm. the periods of instruction, uh, I learned a whole lot because there's some people that were at the class that were teaching things that I'd never even heard anything about. And like the use of, for instance, how to plant a tree, how to fell a tree the use of the interstate system. It's like the things that we do, we drive on the interstate. Well, we drive on roads quite often, but understanding why they're named the way they are and, and using that information to, uh, to orient yourself or to make a decision on which way to go and, and which way is the best way without a GPS system. It's useful information. Absolutely. Some night vision stuff that, that Tom presented that, uh, I'd never really been, it never had been explained to me some of the things where he talked about, and I don't want to get into it now because we're running out of time, but right, yeah, we were. I learned a lot there. Um, just every, but every single person that did a POI there, I learned something from, which yep. was nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kind of a, if you, if you think about it this way, an instructor development class is a quick way to learn a little bit about a lot of things. <laughs> it's a quick way to become a, a renaissance man yeah yeah there you go so uh long story short uh and that is and we're gonna talk about just a couple more things and then we're gonna move on uh do you do you know did you read the fox and the hedgehog the fox and the hedgehog yeah i read the fox and the grapes oh no i was i, I just had an epiphany about instructor development class hmm so historically, leaders and in, in specifically leaders of war, um, generals and whatnot, have been foxes or hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. There's not very many people that are both. A fox knows many things. A hedgehog knows one big thing. And I was just thinking about the instructor development class. It helps you do both. An instructor development class helps you be a fox and a hedgehog because you learn a, a little bit about a lot of things. But then you learn a lot about one thing, and that's instructing and teaching people. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I, I we polled people uh, in the class. And, and some of the people in the class, some of the students, this was their first 
professional instruction, coaching, teaching class. And then some of them had been to others. Uh, and me, you know, like I said, when I went through the, uh, the NRAs, uh, one years ago, you didn't, you, you didn't get up in front of the class and deliver any teaching. Mm -hmm. Your, your job was to sit in a chair and listen to the guy up front talk. And then he's going to give you a piece of paper or he's going to give you a paper test. You're going to fill it out. They're going to grade it. And they're going to tell you whether you pass or fail, but that pass or fail. So I passed that which meant I, I was able to exercise rote memorization and I memorized the stuff that he told me. But I don't understand really how that makes, some, makes you a good instructor. Like I, you can read a book and know, what, and know everything that's in the book and then that makes you a good instructor. It actually doesn't. <laughs> it actually doesn't make you a good no, instructor. No, instructing, yeah, actually getting reps in makes you a good instructor. Yeah. Yeah, you have the more to, you do, the better you do. Exactly, getting. you have to get in reps, um, and, and the best way to get it, the best way to get, you're like, well, eventually, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to charge people money to take my class, and 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 then, you know, after I've been doing it for a while, I'll be good. But actually, you want to be able to deliver it well before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people give you money. Yeah, yeah, because they're paying you for it. You need to give the student the best you can possibly give them. Is that how that's supposed to work? Yeah. Okay. But one of the things is like with a group of peers, like in this class, I was more nervous to present to these people that took these students that took this class than a group of strangers that I'd never met in my life because I knew there's two reasons. They were my peers. And secondly, the, the POI portion of the class, the purpose of that is to be judged and, and get feedback on how to do better. And so it's like, you, you know, you're going into this with people that, you know, they're going to be brutal because they're your friends. But then also the whole purpose of that is to judge the person that's doing the period of instruction. Mm. Yep. You are being judged. All right. The week, uh, this week on student of the gun university podcast, uh, last week we began a series, the four pillars of combat, Last week was mindset. This week is going to be tactics. So make sure that you tune in uh, on your favorite podcast outlet, whatever that happens to be. It could be the exact same one that you're using to listen to this. How about that? I know, I know. How about that? How about that? Uh, question, how did you break your stiletto uh, in the most stupid way? He stepped too hard. No, in the most stupid way that you could imagine. No. A pole uh, was involved? No, a pole wasn't involved. Uh, I was, I was, I climbed into the truck and I looked and, and down at the floorboard and I saw like an empty soda can or it wasn't a soda can. It was a monster can. Uh, and I, so I was like, oh, there's some, some garbage from the road trip that I need to get out of here. So I took a bag and I bagged up all the garbage, but I wanted to get going because I need, I was on my way to go somewhere. So I grabbed it all up, put it in a bag, popped the door open, uh, stepped out and headed for the garbage can, the outdoor garbage can. And I always keep the stiletto in my front right pocket, right? Well, it caught, the clip caught on the edge of the door. It caught on the door of the truck door and it snapped the head right off, broke it clean off. So the base was in my pocket and the head part with the clip was on the ground. And I, I, I think if you are familiar with that brand uh, or that style of light, you know that it was, well, it's fornicated. Yeah. That fornicated it right there. So, yeah. and it just so bummed me out because I've been carrying that light every single day for years. Years. At least three years. It was just time. It's time to get so, a new one. Sucked, man. But you can't replace that one. No, because that one was a gift. Yeah sucks all right tomorrow on student of the gun radio on the bonus hour on the big old bonus hour yeah big old bonus hour uh we're gonna talk about Honor for short yeah we're gonna talk about uh, we have a fighting fitness for you tomorrow and uh, during the fighting fitness we're gonna get all up into your brain about omega sixes and omega threes and what the consumption of them do to your brain 
We're going to have a leadership lesson. Quick aside about the fighting fitness. If you have been listening for a while, even if you're new and you're not part of the grad program, this is the show that you need to spend $1 to attend. Okay? Yeah, you need to get in on this. This I'm is serious. extremely important. This is going to be worth way more than $1 to you. Yeah. Go to getsotg.com, join the undergrad program, and join us for the fighting fitness on SOTG 1160 part two is the episode number. Yeah. I, I don't mean, I don't, I hate to be, uh, I don't want to have the epitome of hyperbole here. <laughs> the epitome of hyperbole. the epitome of hyperbole. Uh, I don't want to be hyperbolous, but uh, this tomorrow's episode, Thursday's bonus hour, could change your life for the better. It could really change your life for the better. And if you, we've been selling you to Explain gykops for a while, right? Get your kids out of public schools. Get them out. Get them out. Get them out. No, my schools. Stop. We've got a story that should enrage you. And, but, well, this is the world in which we live. So you can make, you know, this is, we're going to present you with the facts and then you can make your own decision. How's that sound? That's all tomorrow. Uh, go to getsotg.com, sign up, be there, we'll be there, we'll have a good time. Until then, you boys have anything else to tell me? You're a student. You're a, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at the Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly? Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for new content each and every day at Student of the Gun. Watch Student of the Gun TV and videos from our trusted partners on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Chromecast, and even AirPlay. Go to studentofthegun.com for direct links. And remember, you're a beginner once, a student for life.